I'm going to piss off people when I say that. <laughs> all right, all right. Hello, 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 my friends. Thank you for joining me. I'm Nicholas W. Fuller, and this is Person Behind the Pages, the show where we get to know the people that make the things we love. I'm joined today. Hang on. And now I'm live on Instagram, too. Hello. Yeah. First behind the pages, just joined today by me here. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Nicholas. And a kudos to you for especially because I know it's very late for you on your time. No, no, this is this is when I thrive, man. This is I, I like. I mean, <laughs> we're gonna start with a tangent right away. If it was up to me, I would be more like the Brandon Sanderson, where like sleep until noon or something, you know. Yeah. But I have to be up at like just before six in the morning, every morning to help get my son up and get him have breakfast and get him to the school bus at seven in the morning. So that's okay. I know that as well. It's the same for me, but that's oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't know Brandon Sanderson sleeps until like the middle of the day and then he just goes about his. You know, so his, Oh man. His, yeah. His, he, his writing routine is that he, um, I think he, I guess he wakes up around like 11. He has said, so and he'll so he'll he wakes up around eleven, kind of gets ready, whatever. Starts writing at twelve, writes until four, spends mm -hmm. the next few hours with his family, and he's like that, like the phones away, everything, like just yeah, like with the family. family yeah. And then around like ten o'clock, he picks up writing again, ten p.m., and writes for another four-hour session. Wow! Right, and then oh, he no. doesn't go to bed until like you know three or four Ooh, in the morning or okay. something like that. Yeah. Now, if only George R. R. Martin can pick up half of that discipline, <laughs> right. the next book, and probably the next book in the next three years, maybe or four years. But, right, right. Well, that's my jibe at George. Hey, hey, how Beth, doing? how you doing? Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being here, Tim, my buddy. What's up, man? Thanks for joining. Appreciate you being here. I'm sure we. I tend to get more and more people joining as I, as I go on. Me here, me here. So, yeah, we've got. So much to talk about. I don't think, like you know, you're you're humble me you here because you're like I don't I know, man. Myself. I'm humble. I know myself. That's the truth. <laughs> you're, you're like ah, it's gonna be boring. No, 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 no. You've got fun stuff to talk about. You're an indie book champion with fantasy book critic, um, but you've got some interesting stories as well. So I'm excited to get into all sorts of stuff. Um, go ahead. No, it's just great. Thank you, nonetheless. And hello to Bo as well. Yeah. Bo's the man. Appreciate Bo. Um, where do I even want to begin me here? Um, let's talk books to start with. And then I want to get into talking about you. So let's... T okay. Fantasy... So first of all, actually, I should mention that you, you graciously offered to do a giveaway. So anyone that's uh, watching... Uh, yes. Has an well, opportunity. What are we? How are we going to do this, me here? What do you? What do you want to do? You're going to pick someone that's commenting. I, yeah, basically, you can just say hello, and you'll be entered in like the giveaway. Basically, and this is all thanks to Beth as well, because she had this brilliant idea of coming up with South Asian or focusing on South Asian science fiction and fantasy, you know, as part of the Grimdark magazine. So I'm basically helping or basically giving away three copies of the Grimdark magazine's newest edition, which is book, I mean, edition issue number 38, which is focusing on so many brilliant stories, you know, from R. Wordy, from Gauranth Mohanty, from Vajra Chakranta Shekhar. There's interviews with Lavanya, Lakshmi Narayan. There's interviews with, like, you know, Shazi, uh, the reader at work. There's book, Angie, uh, Angie the Bookaholic, Anita Gade, who's, who are both booktubers. There's a lot more stuff, and it is all thanks to Beth Tabler. So, you know, big, big, big kudos to her, to Adrian Collins and the Grimdark team for basically even thinking of this and then, you know, having the basically the guts and everything to go forward with it, you know, to approach the authors because I'm pretty sure all the authors are so, so, so happy and it has a kick ass cover. Like that cover is just amazing. Oh, oh, where is the cover on uh, the website? I, I want to say yes. Um, I can pull it up and I think it's on my Kindle. But if you know, you can, I guess. I I think that you can screen share on your side too, right? Yeah, yeah, you should be able yes, to. I believe. Took me two so years, dang. Well, I mean, I, I will tell you that I think Ronnie, our Verdi, he was very excited for it. Obviously, he yeah. was very excited for it. So I think it's it's paid off. Good work, Beth, you know? I loved his story, Reed Lions. And that's basically the cover is based on his, uh, his, uh, his story called yeah. Reed Lions. And it is just too, too, too good. 
and that cover is really amazing. Cool. I appreciate you very much, Mihir, offering to uh, to post this giveaway. That like I, I've had a couple of other people like just surprise me by wanting to offer giveaways while we're and I'm like, yes, including Beth. Thank you, Beth, for doing that as well. Oh, it's all Beth's idea. So she is the main. Uh, she had this brilliant idea, and I was like, I'm gonna steal it. So. <laughs> Yeah, let me know oh, if you can get that cover. I would love for yes, you to share that screen. I can. Let me just see if I can. Oh, there it is. Perfect. Can you all see it? Uh, just a second. Wait for it. Bam! Uh, there we go. And that's uh -huh. the beauty of it. It is, I, I think, if I'm not wrong, it is by Carlos Diaz. Also goes by Camu. Um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but basically the the best part about this is that, you know, if you can see, this is an Indian, well, at least a Punjabi Sikh soldier and, you know, also seen in the background, it's basically a troop of these soldiers who are called Reed Lions because they're kind of considered to be cannon fodder, but they have heart and there's, they have their own story. So what Ronnie or R. Verdi does so brilliantly is that he's focused on them while they're heading towards, uh, what the, the next mission so as to speak but then they you know of course get a new twist in the story and then they have to do something else and just the fact that i think this is the first time a sikh person has been featured on any fantasy book because i've never heard of you know or never seen any sikh person uh and for those who don't know sikhism is one of the religion one of the religions ancient religions of the world about more than 400 years old and one of the key concepts or key aspects of the religion is that they the men have to grow their hair long and which is why they wear the turban because their hair is entwined and the hair most Sikh people's hair goes up to their sometimes their back sometimes even to their feet so they never cut it they have to wash it daily and they're just amazing so this is kudos to Ronnie and to Beth for you know thinking and visualizing this and that's really interesting I, I I yeah you first were talking about Sikh person I'm like I don't know if it is and then I'm like wait a minute yes I do <laughs> but I didn't know that about the hair that's that's really interesting yeah, um, they, have, they, they have five things which they have to do. Each Sikh person, it's like all the five Ks. One of them is Kesh, which means the hair, and they have to keep it. And there's a four other K things that they have to keep on them at all times. But it's it's one of the most, I want to say, I don't want to, I don't, I can't find the right word, but it's one of the, one of the best mankind serving religions out there. And I know I'm kind of sounding very stupid or silly on it, but it's the cons, the, 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 the religion really, the aspects of religion are just based on, you know, duty to oneself and duty to others. And it's like they give away free food, they do a lot and everything. And they're just amazing people. That's nice. That's nice. I wonder if that was, uh, that culture was a uh, influence for George R. R. Martin's Dothraki. Um, probably not. because the Well, yeah. No, yeah. Now that you mentioned almost... like how they're actually good people, I'm like, uh, yeah. but I was thinking more of the hair, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But maybe, you know, with George, I know he, he, he has kind of like taken a lot of stuff from everywhere, so probably yeah. But I, I, yeah, the besides the hair part, because the Mongols didn't really grow their hair that long, but mm -hmm. everything else, but the Dothraki is from purely the, no, the yeah, that makes culture. sense. That makes sense. I didn't think about yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially the horn, there are yep, some horse. Cool, cool stories though about like you know the the the, the Sikh people and the, the the founder of the Sikh Empire, Ranjit Singh Ji. He was a brilliant, brilliant man. He was a one-eyed. He basically came from like a. Um, he wasn't noble. He was born of like a simple, you know, not a, not necessarily peasant, but like a commoner son. And through his greatness and his bravery, he founded the Sikh Empire. And you know that was one time where it was quite peaceful in the northern part of the Indian subcontinent. And mm -hmm. you know you had like different people. He in fact had lots of Europeans coming in, you know, as part of his court and helping mm -hmm. him defeat the British Empire as well back then. So again. A little bit of story. Sorry, I I tend to blabber on, and I'll just shut up. Me here? No, don't. That's what we're here for. We're here for blabbing on. No, I want to hear it. That's fantastic. No, that, that, I think that's really interesting. I think there's there's so many interesting stories within history too that we can draw on, and and like either you know, there's certainly there's room for historical fiction. I talked to okay. Baptiste a little while ago. Who wrote Undead Samurai. Mm -hmm. That was really cool. You know, oh, yes. uh, right? Um, yeah the cover i haven't read it but i love the cover right right or uh you know perfect uh to inspiration like we were just talking about for george R. R. martin's dothraki as the mongols that makes so much sense now that i'm thinking about it and you mentioned that it's like one for one right like you could almost have been like i mean 
If yeah, more yeah. people can adapt stories from the Indian subcontinent, I'm going to be happy. It doesn't matter if you are from the Indian subcontinent or if you have ancestry from the subcontinent or even if you don't have anything. But the fact that if you're willing to write it, write it. Because, you know, as science fiction fantasy readers, I, like, or people like me, we are starved. Like, we don't have any fiction focusing on them. So if you can, if you want to write about Sikh warriors, if you want to write about Ranjit Singh Ji, you want to write about, like, you know, some particular aspect of Indian history or Nepali, you know, Nepali culture mm-hmm. or Bhutan culture, Go ahead because it's going to be amazing and people going to be, will want to read it. Yeah. All right. So perfect, me here. So there's more and more people kind of joining us. Thanks for joining us. I'm Nicholas W. Phil. I'm joined by me here. Um, and so I think that what I want to do is I want to mm-hmm. talk first about you. Uh, and of course, you've mentioned uh, the Indian continent. You're an immigrant from India and you lived in some different parts of, of the US. And I think that'll be fun to talk about. And then I want to get into a little bit more about, of course, talking about probably what people know you for a little bit more around my neck of the woods, right? They know you uh, from Fantasy Book Critic. They know you as a kind of someone involved with Spiffbo. Um, and anyway, so we're going to get to that real quickly. Sure. We're, we're doing this giveaway of three copies of the latest edition oh. of Grim Dark Magazine. So thank you for that. Um, yes. What is your involvement with Grim Dark Magazine? Because I obviously I knew that you were involved with Grim, uh, Fantasy Book you know, Critic, but besides okay, being okay. a fan of it, I have zero involvement. I have always loved reading their issues just because you know they have so many cool short stories and they have author interviews. Um, I I would love to be involved, but I I have you know just the the the, the mental bandwidth is not there. So I'm, I'm, I'm I count myself as a cheerleader for Beth Tabler and the team. <laughs> so you know if that counts as involvement, then yes, I'm the, I'm a cheerleader. <laughs> Pretty sure this is a troll. <laughs> Pretty sure this is a troll. Um, so, but let, okay, so that's cool yeah, that you're a cheerleader. That's wonderful. Uh, let's talk about you, me here. So, when did you, you you were born and raised in India? When did you immigrate to the United States? Oh, uh, yep, born and raised in India, and I actually immigrated to the United States back into Christmas Day, two thousand seven. Uh, Christmas yeah. Day. Well, I guess I assume that you're not Christian. So Christmas Day was a uh, another day for you, right? I mean, I mean, we we I knew about it. Like, you know, I knew what Christmas <laughs> is. Like, you know, because India, of course, uh, does celebrate Christmas, just not to the whole level that maybe you know it is get celebrated yeah. over here. But believe me, um, oh, fun fact about uh, for followers of Christ, Thomas the Apostle was actually buried in India. So Christianity is actually as old as it is in the rest of the world because Thomas actually traveled from you know, the Middle East, all the way to India, to the southern part of India called Kerala. And that's where he actually, Krishandi, from where Krishandi spread. So we do know about it. You know, there's, you know, mass oh. and everything. I personally don't go to mass. Uh, I'm not a Christian. Not that, you know, I don't have a big problem against like people going to mass, you know, welcome to. Uh, but yeah, I moved to, <laughs> that's why I remember it so distinctly because it was Christmas Day. So yeah. people at the Houston airport wished us for Merry Christmas and we were able to wish them back Merry Christmas. Nice, nice. Uh, that is interesting. I really didn't know that about Tonsi Paul. I'm not a practicing Christian either. I'm, I, my fancy title is that mm-hmm. I'm a uh, agnostic secular humanist. Doesn't that sound kind of, uh, you know? Perfectly fine. That's actually, we right? need more people like that, honestly. Right. I just happened to mention that because that's yeah. one of the cool, like, my brain is like a weird magnet for these weird factoids <laughs> and this is something which I had learned. And I, I, I know a lot of, not a lot of people know that, which is why I like to throw that in. Yeah, you know, it's it's like if you want to go to India, you can also go to Kerala and visit, you know, Thomas Church. Even if you're a non-believer, it's absolutely okay because it's just a cool thing to sit on. That's really interesting. Utterly awesome. How you doing? Hello. Thanks for being here. Um, uh, I have heard that. I'm trying to remember where I heard this, anyway, but regardless, that uh, some t- you know, speaking of you know, it's it's not uh, unheard of over there, and there's some celebration, but like uh, because of outsourcing some some places where where there is a lot of like customer service outsourcing in india the the Mm -hmm. people that are doing that work end up adopting almost out of necessity they end up adopting a lot of like u.s holidays oh yeah they have to yeah because they need to be fluent about like you know what holiday it is what day it is and you know what so they can wish them Uh, Mm -hmm. fun fact i actually was once on a phone call and the call center was located from where i was from in india in bombay literally from oh really I heard from people talking about a restaurant, and I was like, that is, I know that restaurant. It's from where I used to live in Bombay. So that was just, and actually, after the call was getting over, and I just asked them, hey, are you folks located in Bombay? They were like, yes. How did you know? And then I switched over to Hindi tell them, like, I know, because I was living over there. So, yeah. <laughs> How did they react? Were they like, oh, my God. <laughs> well, they were, 
I, I don't know if they would they 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 I don't know if they believe me or not, but like I just because I spoke in Hindi and then they and of course my like that's the one thing about Indians. We you look at our names and we can know from each of the names where which part of India they're from. And mm. so from my name, at least they knew that they're talking to an Indian. And of course, my accent is a dead giveaway. It's like it's like every, you know, like like you mentioned, call center accent. It's it's not sexy, but it'll probably get the job. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you. Yeah, you speak uh, perfectly great. Um, yeah, so, uh, Bombay. I guess now these days it's known as Mumbai. Mumbai. Yep. All right. That's uh, my wife's cousin's husband is also from Mumbai, but now he lives in Paris, France, and he works Ooh. for like a Swiss company. Wow. Made, oh, that's pretty cool. Right. Right. Uh, we share stories about Bombay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's pretty neat. Uh, isn't yeah, Bombay though. Tell me a little bit about Bombay while you were living there, because it's a it's a huge oh. city, right? Twelve point oh, five huge. million people. More, I want to say it's closer to fifteen to twenty million right now, just because Bombay is the concept of Bombay is expanding. So Bombay basically means like in a bomb bay. That's how it was. It was basically given. Okay, sorry for the history lesson. It was given. As I a want the history lesson. Don't apologize. Give it to me. Of England by the Portuguese because you know it was just basically seven islands and they kind of con they, they kind of landfilled them and they made this like city port city. Mm -hmm. And Bombay has tried because Bombay has this unique aspect of being so you know, for the people in the U.S. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. no. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, but Bombay has this unique aspect of being like the New York and being like mm -hmm. LA in the sense that. New York is a financial capital and LA is, you know, the Hollywood, like the, the cinema mm -hmm. capital of the US. But in Bombay, we have both of these things together. So we also have Wall Street, which is, you know, for which is in Bombay. And also we mm -hmm. have Bollywood, which is, you know, in bulk in Bombay. And Bombay is an interesting place because it is jam-packed with people. Mm -hmm. It is a city that never sleeps, literally, because you can even go at 3 a.m. in the middle of the night. And I have done this because we are exiting from the airport at the middle of the night. And there are still people on the road. There's still traffic. Oh, God, the traffic. It's really bad. <laughs> and as a Bombay person, I can say that. Believe me, I've lived all my whole life in Bombay, so I know the traffic. And Bombay is has grown, or Mumbai, as it's known, has grown. Because previously, when I was growing up, we lived in the suburbs. But right now, that's considered the city proper. And what I used to travel to, to which is outskirts of the city, is now mm -hmm. considered part of the city. So Bombay is expanding. It is great if you want to go for, you know, trying for food, for... A, if even if you go around in Bombay, chances are you'll see a Bollywood shoot because there's a lot of shootings going on for TV shows, for nowadays for OTT shows, for movies, and you know you never know whom you can see. But also the traffic is really bad, and I'm sorry. To say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it, it like I uh, went to Istanbul, mm -hmm. and th there's some places in the world where it feels like everything, every like traffic light, every traffic stop is a suggestion. <laughs> That that's the whole of India. Like that's so, the whole of it. Yeah, yeah. Because that's the thing is, you know, when when people who are driven over here, they go to India. They're just the chaos in the roads scares them because there's no lane. There's no lane traffic. Like people won't drive in lanes. There's people just merging and driving. So one of the one of the weird things is that if you know how to drive in India, you can drive anywhere in the world. And that's honestly true <laughs> because we in India it's mostly manual. So you have to really be you know sure. be okay. up on top, you know, changing gears and everything. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's two wheelers, there's three wheelers, there's people walking, and it all. Sometimes there's cows on the road. I'm not even kidding. There are cows on the road. Who just in in Bombay? Oh yeah. When I was going, oh, we had like a cow shed near in one of the places, and the cows at a certain time would literally just go and sit on the road till for a few hours, <laughs> and the traffic would just back up, and you had to the traffic would just go around the cows because the cows like people would not be pushing them away, and it's true. That's so, wild. Yeah. Well, I mean, perfectly normal there, but <laughs> can you imagine? Like, that's so funny though. Yeah, I mean, especially the way it's Bollywood and Wall Street. Can you imagine like cows just obstructing traffic in the middle of of you know Manhattan? Um, I mean, th that would be a big thing over here. Probably it would be featured on TikTok and everywhere. In, <laughs> right. in India, it's, just, it's normal. I mean, of course, it's a yes, Tuesday. Yeah, right. It's, it's nobody even bats an eyelid. Sometimes, you know, the cops would come and the traffic police would come and just move the cows along if it was too much backed up. But mm -hmm. it was, it was honestly normal. It was very, very, very normal. Uh, sometimes That's elephants would walk on the road. And I, okay, I, I know how weird this sounds, but, you know, we had people like, you know, who would bring the elephants for, and it would be, it would be okay because you know, just traffic would merge around them. I'm, 
I'm not even kidding. Like, in some, I wish I had taken video. Of course, we didn't have cell phones back then, but there are some really strange situations I've seen in the road where I wish I had a video, a cell phone, so I could record the video just to show people now how it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's uh, sounds wild. So, uh, you know, and you move to the U.S. What what precipitated the move to the U.S. Anyway? Oh, uh, in this, I can blame my mother. Uh, so <laughs> my mother. My uh, no, I don't blame my mother. Uh, she's really super kind because it's uh, my mother was my mother's side of the family. You know, they had moved to the, the to the U.S. a long time ago, and my mom was practicing back in India. And of course, I was in you know in my school days and everything. So when we got the opportunity to you know to get a green card, she because her her mom had applied for it, you know, and finally her turn came. So she's like, okay, we can try to go over there because I want to be a doctor over there. Mm-hmm. So. My thanks to my mom when she came, but then my sister could come because she had just not started college. But I was in you know middle of my medical college, so I couldn't come over come over here. So I and my dad had stayed behind until I finished my college, and then we all moved you know to to be over here. And that's when we moved to Texas because my mom was doing residency back then over there in Texas. So that's how we got to Texas, and that was an adventure. Um, right. Yes. So you moved from uh, Mumbai, Mumbai to, to you Texas. get on a plane. Right yep. to Houston on Christmas yes. Day. Yes. Bunch of that Texans was... saying, Merry Christmas to you, you know? Yes. <laughs> Wait, did I mean, you live we... in the Houston area? Oh, I did. I, w- I was living very close to the Reliance Stadium, which is like the stadium where the Texans used to okay. play. Um, and it is near the medical center. Fun fact about the med- Houston Medical Center. It is, at that moment, at least this was back in 2010, it was the biggest medical center in the entire United States. I'm sure it is still the biggest medical center in the entire United mm-hmm. States. Um, and yeah, it was it was nice, except on Sundays when there would be football games and the te- people would drive from like two hours away and they would just get pissed off because the Houston Texans were really bad back then. And this is from 2008, <laughs> right. 2012, I remember this. Because right. they would go in all excited, and then after the game, they would just be <laughs> honking and coming on. You could see it on their faces; they would be red, they'd be pissed off that the team lost once again to the you know Indianapolis Colts or whichever team was coming along. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah. Not Houston, just the, the Colts. I mean, sorry, the Texans losing once again because they were mm-hmm. really bad. Mm-hmm. I didn't know anything about football, but yet I knew that they were a bad team. You do, yeah, yeah. I have uh, I have an in person writing group that meets every Saturday morning, and there's four people. One of them is this wonderful person that everyone's going to know someday. His name is J.A. Ross. It's, ah. But okay. uh, for now, uh, you know, the thing that you'll know about him now is that that man, <laughs> he has a religion and it's not Christianity. It is football. And I, mean, I think it's because he's from Texas oh, and like, and there it definitely goes yes. like, God, guns, and football, you know? Right? Oh, yeah. Like, Friday is high school football, Saturday is college yeah. football, and Sunday is NFL. And the yeah. only reason and is I lived in Texas, and <laughs> oh, dear God, they would just... And that's your whole weekend. If you're in Texas, that's your weekend, you know? Yes, easily. Like, it was... I mean, football, is that, it's honestly very true. Like, you know, it, does, it sounds like, you know, we are doing hyperbole, but no, it's not. Yeah. They literally, I mean, if your quarterback is, you know, good or really good, then, yeah, he's yeah. the second coming of Christ. For them, <laughs> that's true. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then somebody's got to be making barbecue for all to get together, and like, and that's that's Texas. That's those are the yes. things that you. Yeah, it's interesting that like one. Okay, so a little bit it's serious. Um, yeah, I don't really love Texas, but like one of the things that was interesting about um, kind of talking or uh, there was an online discussion that I was eavesdropping. I think it was on Reddit, and someone mm-hmm. was talking about how. They moved from, you live in Oregon now. They, they used to live in Oregon. Then they moved over to Texas because they were like, hell yeah, guns, pew, pew. You know, I'll be able to go out and hunt and whatever. Um, but they got there and they're like, actually, this sucks. Because uh, all of, like, while the gun laws are, like, better for someone that wants mm-hmm. a bunch of guns and whatever, they're like, there's no place for me to go hunt. In in Oregon, there's a bunch of federal land and I can go out and, and do it. In Texas, everywhere is owned privately. And unless you know yeah. the owner, you can't yeah, get yeah. on and go hunt. Or you, you go know? to like the northern or the western. Like, you know, it's the Texas is huge, so you can potentially find stuff. But yeah, if you're living near the big cities, yeah, it's, yeah. it's hard. And it's always you need to, I mean, not that I know anything about hunting. I'm not a gun owner. Nor I know nothing about guns. But yeah, I mean, the, 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 coming from India where we never see guns or we solely see guns on cops to seeing people just randomly carry, and not just like simple, small revolvers. Like you would have people carrying like 
at least what I thought were like semi-automatics stuff like that, just randomly slung over the shoulder in the bus. And I'm like, why? Are they going to a shoot? Like, what's what's like? And when I say shoot, I mean film, TV shoot. Like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why would you need a gun? So yeah, it was the guns uh, in yeah. Texas are just weird. it's it's odd for somebody who's never lived with guns to just see random people. And I, I'm, I'm like thinking like, do they even know how to handle that? Do like right, right, right. Like, a, whatever. But the good so thing about Texas is that the food is really good. The bad things about Texas is that a lot of people have lots of guns. So. Can Tell me more about the so you 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 moved over from Bombay and obviously you're having a bunch of delicious Indian food I'm sure over there. Uh, yeah. Then you come to Texas I'm sure you had some good barbecue. What else food did you did you get to oh, enjoy? Yes, barbecue. Well, I also happened to get introduced to Vietnamese cuisine, which I still love. Um, I of course got to eat a lot of Thai, Korean. Uh, also, Texas has really good like you know Indian and Pakistani food. So if you were like you know if you I know everybody knows like there's one good Indian restaurant everywhere, but some of the really most delicious food is in you know Texas because there's a lot of Indians and Pakistanis who come, or even Bangladeshis who come, and there's just the food over there is really good. Um, besides that, what else? I'm not a fan of Italian food. That's how I discovered that I'm not a fan of Italian food. I know it's it's sacrilege to say that, but I, I, it's too bland for me. I can blame my Indian genes. So maybe okay, 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 okay. Really you me, you right? can so, like you can. <laughs> I actually didn't think it was sacrilegious until you said it's too bland. What? What? I mean, it is like I, I don't know how else to put it because I even went to Italy. That's the that's the thing. I mean, I'm not even kidding. I actually had gone on a vacation with my wife to Italy, and we went through like the southern parts of Italy to Rome and everything. And I was barely able to eat because I mean, this is again going off in a weird tangent. I eat I, I eat only chicken and lamb, and they didn't really do have a lot. They didn't have a lot of chicken and lamb and beef and pork. I can't eat. And so mm. it was just like I was stuck on eating pizza or vegetarian. And there's only so much stuff you can eat vegetarian. Uh, I say this coming from a land of, you know, where vegetarian food is really good and yummy. But yeah, Italian food is so bland for me. I, I, I know. Please don't hate me. If, I you know, can't believe it. But okay. I guess it. What? I know, Bo, I know gotta, it like, all right. Like, I'm going to dive into it. I have to. Like, what? 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 Uh, how? How wide is your, like, Italian food that you've tried? Like. I can't like. Oh, I, so I tried it in Florence. I tried it in Rome. I tried but what? It in what like? What sorts of dishes? So oh, like, I mean, if you if you've had like if, if like I like a fettuccine it. Alfredo, I could see you being like, okay, that's kind of bland. But like I, an Italian I sausage. Know. Yeah. Oh, I can't eat sausage. That's the thing. Remember, I can't like anything. No, no meat except you know, so lots of pastas. Yeah, like, you know, they had like yeah, lamb okay. pastas. Something I ate that. I ate a lot of pizzas. Everything. But again, I was limited. But as a general rule, what I've found is that Italian food is not as Spicy or flavorful as Indian food, and maybe that's just meat. How that's that's spicy for sure. Yeah, so yeah. it's it's like Italian food, especially for me, just because I've not. I've, of course, I have tasted a lot more nowadays. It still isn't my favorite. Like I would rather go with Thai, sure. Vietnamese, or. I so I'm surprised though that, like you know, yeah, you mentioned Thai, Vietnamese, Korean. Obviously, India is a whole lot closer to all those places. Uh, yeah. But they're not like that. Those things aren't available or weren't at least in Bombay when you were no. there. No, at least, well, because, so keep in mind, when I was growing up, this is back in the 90s, and well, I was born in the 80s, but it was 90s, India was not open as it is now. So like now, mm -hmm. if you go to Bombay, you'll have lots, you'll find people, you know, you can eat Thai, you can eat Korean, but when I was growing up, there was no Thai food, there was no Korean food, there was, the, you had to travel outside of India, to, or maybe go to certain parts of, like, you know, the capital or certain cities where you could taste it. I'm sure Bombay probably had them, but those were, those restaurants were in, like, fancy five-star hotels mm. you, you mm. had no reason to go over there so as a kid yeah i had i had only different different and of course there's so much indian food variety so you i was i and what you don't know you don't know so it was something like that you know my ignorance was my bliss because i yeah. didn't know and of course when i came over here is when i found out like you know there's a whole new world and it was so yummy <laughs> now <laughs> great. Been yeah 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 what is uh i, I know you you know you eat the uh, chicken and lamb but what's your favorite uh vegetarian dish Oh, uh, it's it's hard to describe. So there's something called pani puri, which is it's kind of like a snack, but it can be dinner as well if you want to, because it's just like it's really hard to describe. It's this is the this is the hard part of describing Indian food because the terms are there's no equivalent terms. So it's Ooh, kind of like a, it's like a fried. You have this. See again, I can't describe <laughs> it. It's, it's 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 like an empty, it's like a fried thing, just a bit empty. Yep, you put, like, you know, you put um, this, the green water is the spicy water, the hot, the blue brown water is the hot water. You can put, you know, pieces of uh, uh, potato and then you put, like, you know, a uh, moog, which I don't know what, uh, 
legumes in it. And see, again, I'm messing it up. I'm not. I'm making it sound really unpalatable, but it's not. It, this <laughs> is for me. Narutan kurma. Uh, Narutan kurma is good, but it's more like you have to eat it with gravy. But it, this is one of my all-time favorite foods. Like it's it looks nice. It is so yummy. It is so, and you can eat it with hot water or with cold water. So it's a whole like the north in India. They drink, they eat it with cold water. And in where I'm from yes. in Bombay, they used to make it slightly warmer water. So it's and when I say water, it's the it's the hot and the sweet the sweet sauce and the hot sauce. They can be made with hot and cold water. So it, it mm -hmm. adds a whole new flavor. Interesting, interesting. That's a, yeah, kind of fun to to how yeah, there's also regional differences in in food. You know, so so much. So much. And, Speaking of, you lived in you lived in Texas, and uh, um, but you didn't live in Texas forever. And then your no. your experience of like kind of the the next place you went to was a a little bit different. It sounds like, right? Oh yes, I I moved to upstate New York to be with my wife, you know, because we got married and uh, she didn't want to live alone. Fair point to her. And so <laughs> going from Texas, the Houston humidity to living in Buffalo, New York, where you know no. I love Buffalo. Let me just say that out of the way. Even with the snow and everything, I love Buffalo. I still would rather go back to Buffalo because it is it was one of my it is to this day, I still love that city a lot. It is amazing. And I got introduced to New York style pizza, which I honestly believe is the best pizza ever. Uh I know it's Chicago and send deep dish and everything like that. But west of the Mississippi, there's no good pizza. And unfortunately, <laughs> I've lived over here, like I haven't found good pizza like that. Like I found in New York State, and Buffalo pizza was oh my god, this is amazing. Nice, oh, nice. One fact for people who, uh, you know, if you ever visit the city of Buffalo, besides the hot, besides the wings, because you know, that's where Buffalo is famous for, like you know, the mm -hmm. wing. There's Anchor Bar, there's Duff's, and you know the rivalry goes on. But there's also New York style pizza, and Buffalo has its own special pizza places as well, so you can check out any of them. Nice, nice. And so, ooh, me here taught you how to make chai. It was just a quick tutorial, but Beth probably knew it already. I was just telling her how we used to make it because right, after this, what's what's your what's your secrets for chai? Tell me, me here. I, it's it's not a secret. You just make it in milk, and you know if you want, you can add elaichi, which I don't know what it's called over here, but it adds a, or you can add ginger as well. But hey, if anybody ever makes it to Oregon to you to visit me, you know you you'll get really good yummy Indian food, and I can make chai for you. Is that an invitation? Because open invitation. Yes. What? All right. <laughs> I've got family over there. I'm gonna have to come visit you sometime. Yeah. <laughs> that would be fun. That would be cool. Are there like uh so you live around Portland these days? Are there any good like uh conventions over there? Do you go to like different nerdy conventions too or, or... I I well this is all thanks to Dirk Ashton. I should you yeah. know point out to that because without him I would be lost. But I, I discovered DragonCon. I mean I knew what conventions, but DragonCon I was able to attend in 2018. Thanks mm -hmm. to Dirk, and it was the best time I ever had. Unfortunately, nice. I only attended it for one day. But then I have since then I've been to DragonCon again. So last year I went to DragonCon. It was amazing. I get to hang out with Dirk Ashton, uh, Davis Ashura, Bryce O'Connor, and Phil Tucker, four really amazing indie authors. Nice. And just yeah. four yeah. amazing people. And they are super kind enough to let me hang with them because <laughs> I'm not, a, I'm not a, a famous author. But no, it is so 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 <laughs> much fun. And then uh, I wanted to go to Worldcon 2019, but you know things couldn't work out. And of course, since the pandemic hit, so along with Bo, uh, this year we will be going to Glasgow. And I'm hoping Beth will be there too. And I think there's a few other people who might be coming. So I know Adrian M. Gibson's going to be there. Crystal Matar, I think. Oh, Crystal yeah. Matar, yes, Crystal. I'm yeah. gonna bring something for Crystal, and I'm hoping uh, it didn't get signed my copy of his book. So that'll be cool. Oh, I'm sure he'd be tickled pink if you asked him. That'd be cool. Oh, I. Um, a copy of that so and there's also nice. a bunch of other authors who are coming whom i'm wanting to you know get my uh cool. book signed by so beth says she'll be there there we go Yay! are you doing dragon con this year too unfortunately no because you know uh, as we were talking about earlier we both have young kids so my wife was like you can go for one thing and <laughs> she's kind enough to allow me to go to all the way to, you know across the atlantic pond so yeah. I'm getting to go to um, I'm getting to go to Worldcon, but no, not Dragon. Maybe next year. So again, oh, and right. this we kind of had like a small indie thing uh, at last year at, uh, at DragonCon. So maybe next year again, all of us indie folks and you know reviewers and everybody can just come out again. So that's how I met Bo. It was super fun to hang out with him. I also yeah. hung out with Joe Byrne, Michael Michelle, who's also from Oregon, <sighs> and a bunch. Of, oh, Haley Newell, HC Newell. I got to meet her. She's lovely, lovely, lovely. And I got to meet the fantastic Sherry Priest, uh, you know, whom I've been a fan of. Oh, Shab, how are you? Mm -hmm. 
So. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like Dragon Con this year is going to be a little bit subdued with the authors because of World Con and Glasgow. It sounds like this, but yeah, I got to get my butt to Dragon Con. I haven't, I've been to, there was a while when I lived in Florida, I went to MegaCon every year. Um, oh, okay. And that one was fun, but it's not like especially bookish, you know? Dragon Con, um, I don't know how it became, but Dragon Con has like a lot of indie and lit RPG authors. So even Will White, I think Will yeah. White has been doing this for the last few years. He kind yep. of has like his own parallel thing going on at Dragon Con, and it is huge. Uh, and I, I have heard about this, so that'll mm -hmm. even so I know people. Uh, Pippin Pippin Tux, I think, was another person who had mm -hmm. come to mm -hmm. you know, Dragon Con this year. So honestly, if we we all can coordinate, we should go to Dragon Con next year because it'll be a lot of fun. This seems like I, I feel like next year because yeah, like it seems like this year everyone's like oh, I don't know, but like next year, yeah, we should we should yeah. we, we got to start making the push to make sure everyone goes next year and we can like all have a banging party. Okay, it'll, it'll be a blast. And Shad, you had to come to. Right, Shad's been right. a, a reader whom I've interacted with on Goodreads for like a long, long, long time. So nice, nice, nice. Um, what about a uh, WorldCon uh, twenty twenty five is in Seattle, right? That's the hope. So if that happens, and that'll be cool because that's like a three-hour train ride for me, you know. And then I can just, you know, it's for the weekend. I can just take the train up and then stay over there, and that'll be cool because there's a lot of authors who live in the Pacific Northwest. I mm -hmm. know uh, a book. Charles uh, Baldry, Bookborn, yeah. Bookborn and her husband, the amazing Zach Argyle. Yep, Zach Argyle. There's also Django Wexler and his wife KCL Blair, both authors in their own right. There's okay. Sherry Reese. There is, uh, I'm forgetting the name. Oh, Terry Brooks. For people who don't know, Terry Brooks lives in the Pacific Northwest. I don't know where in the Washington, but he does. Robin Hobb, I believe, lives in the Pacific Northwest as well. So I bet both of them will be coming. Sean Speakman, you know, the, the brain, the genius behind Grim Old Books. Uh, mm -hmm. He lives over there, so he'll be coming. There's And if it's in Seattle, I can bet you there'll be a bunch of people. Who, there's so many others from California as well. Right, right, Chu, right. Peter Kleins, and of course, everybody else as well. But yeah, I, I hope that. This is a good point. Uh, a lot of people coming for Dragon Steel this year. Yeah, that's in November, right? That's the Salt Lake City one. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's Sanderson's con, and then Anderson's he's con. I mean, upgrading. Yeah, the con. That's all you know about that. Right. Right. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, that seems cool, but like my, uh, you know, confession. I've only read Mistborn yet from Brandon Sanderson, and I feel like going to like. His con, I should be a bigger fan before I go to his con, you know. I mean, you could go and I, I stopped uh, reading his books after the first Cosmere books because I didn't really enjoy it. And really? I mean, I'm not gonna go, but if everybody goes and decides like that's the place to be, I'll go over there because I, yeah, I like Brandon Sanderson as a person. Let me just put it that I might not nope. enjoy his yeah. that much, but I like him as a person. So I don't even care that he puts too much salt on his food. <laughs> <laughs> I just wish you would add a little bit more swearing in his books, you know, because it's it seems to be, even if it's made up swearing, but just add the swears. Come on, I know he's a Mormon, sure. but his characters can swear. You know, they don't have to be Mormonish as him. So, all right. So December for Dragon Steel. Buzz, Buzz, giving me that peer pressure to go. <laughs> hey, Bo, yeah, that Bo, might be fun. Bo is really fun to hang out with. So if you can go, I would really recommend it because having hung out with Bo, I can attest to that he's really awesome. Uh, nice. He knows a lot of people, so it's not you just don't meet him. You meet a whole bunch of people. You got to hang out with a lot of people, mm. and it's a lot of fun. Bo's gonna help me rub elbows. Are you gonna, is that what you're gonna do, Bo? Uh, <laughs> Bo, it's it's in like it's in the beginning of December, isn't it? I Tell think it's in November, it. if I'm not wrong. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I somehow felt like I saw pictures which were from November, and that was yeah. Well, school. I think it was definitely November last year. I think it, yeah, yeah, it was like just it was like the weekend before Thanksgiving, I think. Something like that because I saw pictures of oh I uh, I know Sarah Chorn she was mm -hmm. excuse me she was there I saw you know her pictures I saw uh, Bookborn and Zach Argyle's pictures mm -hmm. also major FOMO but oh December there's yeah, no okay. all right so this year yeah, yeah December after Thanksgiving then yeah that might be fun maybe that'll be the one rather than trying to do Dragon Con this year maybe that would be the one that might be fun you, hey, if Bo is going you should go I honestly recommend that yeah yeah I would love to hang out with Bo. It was fun talking with Bo before. Yeah, it'd be fun. You should. You should. All right. So, me here. Um, I guess this is a great segue into talking about books. Um, yes. And that's what most people are going to kind of uh, know you from, most of my audience. So, you're part of the team at Fantasy Book Critics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is a sp spiffbo judging organization, right? Part, yeah, we have been mm -hmm. helping judge uh, SPFPO since 2015, the original year. Yes. You were oh, wow. I didn't know. Wow. 
Uh, oh geez cool <laughs> um um what is what is your specific involvement with fantasy book critic i know that you manage all the oh. well at least the twitter right yeah uh uh well i i, I won't really call it manager or anything but i uh, i am in charge of you know at least the twitter part of so all but no fantasy book critic is a, is a team let me just say that right out uh right out of the bat i'm part mm -hmm. of the team i did not found find a uh, pound fantasy book critic that was done by the amazing robert thompson he started fantasy book Critic in 2007 you know we also had Liviu and cindy who were part of uh oh hello nj uh mm -hmm. we who were part of fantasy book critic and then i joined in 2009 like late 2009 and since then you know uh you know all those three They've just because they've become become busy busy in their personal lives, but then we also had a few other members join in. So we had David Stewart, then we had the amazing Lucas who joined in from like you know late, latter half of 2015 or maybe 2017 ish onwards as well. We also have uh, Shazzy now. We have oh god, why am I forgetting names? This is my weird part. Like my brain just does not remember names when I need to remember names. <laughs> I'm missing out one major person, so I'm so sorry. I have to look up because. I'm, I can see her face in my brain, but I cannot mm -hmm. remember her name, and that's just really bad of me. But it's, it's, uh, it, it happens. It happens. Caitlin, Caitlin, thank oh God, Caitlin, Caitlin has been you know an amazing person as well. So it's basically now, to be honest, Lucas, Caitlin, Shazzy, and me form like the main core focus of Fantasy Book Critic. Mm -hmm. Shazzy runs the, runs the Instagram page. Mm -hmm. I run the Twitter. Uh, <laughs> Lucas mainly, uh, you know. Helps with like you know helps or basically <laughs> organizes our SPFPO and Caitlin also posts reviews and everything. So yeah, that's us. And then of course we have more the members. We have Daniel, we have Lena, we have Matthew Higgins as well. So we have a few other members, but they are of course busier as well. So they might not contribute as much. But Fantasy Book Tech always has been a team. Mm -hmm. So okay, very cool. You said since two thousand nine you've been involved. Yeah. Good I, lord, I, man! Fifteen I, years. I have been reviewing since, oh dear God, that's right, 15 years old. Yes, I have been reviewing since 2009. I have my reviews in the earlier earlier part were a lot more frequent nowadays, of course, with since the you know birth of my kids and my job becoming busier and busier, my reviews have gone. I still read, I just now don't get the time to read because a lot of times when I was, you know, before the birth of my kids, I would just, you know, come home, read more, just write my reviews, get them posted, you know, do all of that. So sure. it might not might be as frequent, but I still do read or at least try to read. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's that's amazing. That's cool. Um, okay. <laughs> also, remind me again. What year did you immigrate to the United States? Two thousand seven. <laughs> so years two later. years after you, yeah, yeah, yeah. At that, so when you joined a uh, fantasy book critic, were you living? Did you had you already moved to New York, or were you still in? No, Texas? I was. Still, I was still living in Texas back then. So you I were. Knew. This is this is why. This is why, huh? You were in Texas, and you were like, I need to get out, and you're just like getting in the pages, going like, Ah, this is better. This is better. Was well, the... <laughs> I mean, the, 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 to be fair to Texas, uh, there's a lot of, especially in, city, in the city of Houston, there's a lot of, you know, bookstores, independent as well as, you know, there's like this chain of bookstores called Half Price Books, which mm -hmm. were my mecca because I used to go there every Sunday because, you know, every store, uh, there's like four stores in the, main, in the main Houston area. And, you know, you didn't, you never knew what books you were going to get. And of course, coming from India, where there's not a lot of science fiction fantasy available. So I, you know, when I was getting into science fiction fantasy, the problem was I couldn't, even if I read one book, I was not sure I would get the sequel. Or if I was reading a series, I would get maybe the, the book three and then book seven. Uh, mm -hmm. And I did not get the rest. So that was like half price books was my savior because I could just buy. And of course, I was not, you know, earning a lot that way because I was also doing my master's. So, you know, it allowed me to still, you know, grab a lot of paperbacks, read through a lot more, get introduced to a lot more authors as well. So I love Texas nice. for that, just nice. not for the weather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... Okay, so I don't, I don't, I feel like sometimes this can be made into a competition, and I don't like that, but mm -hmm. I am curious, like, roughly how many, I am a very slow reader, and I will be, you know, I, I don't read a ton of books every year, but I enjoy the ones that I read, and I think that's more important, but how many books do you read in a, in a year? I bet it's probably more than 10. <laughs> Does it, do I have to count read reads? Because I read a lot of my favorites as well. That's fantastic. No, oh, I mean, whatever you want, however you want. So if I, if you're just counting about like original books, like you know books which are new, I read anywhere between fifty to maybe seventy new books ish. Yeah, uh, that's not wow. counting graphic novels or comic books because like they're fun, but I don't like I like, don't really count them as like books I've read because they're not big enough. Yeah, and then I read, read a lot of books. Like I read, read series from time to time, which I love. Like one of my favorite things to read, read is David Gemmell's books. I read, mm -hmm. read 
like Schaefer's books because his series is still go. I mean, her series is still mm -hmm. ongoing. So I like to read it, you know, the past Daniel Foss or how many black books because I just love them so much. Uh, I like to read the Mahabharata from time to time because I have different editions of it. So I, I do read it a lot. If I count the read books, it's going to go over 100. But it, then it's, I don't like to count it because it seems like I'm showing off. I'm not. I just like my mind no, 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 like yeah, yeah. I don't. I'm not. And I'm not asking to give you a platform to show. Off. But I do. Uh, first, Bo, like, how do you keep them from melting and living in Texas? I don't know. AC. I don't know. AC, AC, and AC. That's yeah, the one. Yeah, that right? would, like you know, you if you're anywhere, the AC is going to be on and you're going to be super pleasant. But the moment you step out, you're going to be blasted with hot air, hot humid air. That is, I mean, Texas, like. I don't know yeah. how it was before the invention of the uh, AC, but yeah, AC right. is a safe place. When I lived in uh, Central Florida, it was the same, and especially in the summer. Like, I mean, because yeah, like Central Florida has two seasons: it has summer and it has hell. Yeah, <laughs> and, I know. <laughs> you never know as well, right? Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But yeah. So, I'm so, so but that means like on on average, you're reading like two books a week, right? Depending on the weeks, yes, roughly about yeah. one to two books a week. That's interesting. Okay, again, I don't count reading -read books, so sometimes I might just read more than two books as well, just because I'm rereading them. So I know, you know, my pace gets faster and faster. So when that's do you like? Do you when this? Is, I've not, sorry, I'm trying to gather my thoughts here. I just started reading a book recently on speed reading. Right, like how to speed read, uh, because I'd love to read more, and I've kind of always shied away from it because I was concerned that it would uh, hurt my my comprehension and retention. But it seems like that's not necessarily true. Um, but one of the things I found fascinating just in like the beginning of the book is it's talking about well, we learn to read when we're very young, and we never sort of revisit the skill, which is makes sense. Um, and as we learn to read, we the main way that we're really learning to read in the very beginning is that people have us read out loud. And yeah. then your reading speed is dictated by your speaking speed. You can't then read faster than you can speak. I suspect that you do, right? Well, I that that's the advantage I have. I think in the most Indians, we kind of have this fast speaking style because that's what mm -hmm. I've been in, in over here, especially when I moved to Texas. Like, slow down, slow down, slow down. So maybe it's that. I honestly, I don't know. I like, I never thought of my reading speed as being fast, but I guess maybe it is. But I just like for me, when I click with the book, I want to know what happens next. Yeah. And so I cannot stop. I physically cannot stop myself because I'm just zooming through. And sometimes I realize that. You know uh, that I miss certain things. So I'll have to go back and read because this is what happened a lot with George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire books. So mm -hmm. They were so exciting that I was just zooming through. Then I was like, "Wait a second, he's referencing something which what happened, but I'm not exactly sure what happened." So I had to go back and read certain sections of it. And then I was like, "Oh wait, that didn't happen the way it was." But anyways, but that, but yeah. So <laughs> I, maybe I, I talk too fast. Maybe that's why my brain just keeps on going a little bit faster. So purple <laughs> glasses, because you know, trying to read doesn't help. It's not really good on the eyes. That's interesting. Okay. Um, what is your, I'm just curious too, what's your like preferred format? Do you like uh, paperbacks? Do you like ebook? Do you do some, do you throw in some audio books in there also? Unfortunately, not a lot of audio uh, because mm -hmm. my, you know, since the pandemic, I've been staying at home. I've been not staying at home. Ah, make it sound like so, like I'm hermit. No, I've been working from home. So listening to audio, uh, you know, otherwise, when I was traveling to work, I could at least do some audio, but it was not mm -hmm. a lot. The tricky part about audio is my brain again wanders. So then I'm like, wait, what are they talking about? Preferred mm -hmm. format is paperback because, you know, traveling with it is easier, but I just happen to love the convenience of ebooks. I can travel with my, you know, Kindle almost anywhere. Yeah. I can yeah. have thousands of books and that has mm -hmm. been that has been like a good thing because my wife has given me five and a half bookshelves and she's told me you can triple stack do whatever you want that's all the book space you're getting <laughs> so having you know I, I, and and you know being able to buy kindle books so that way she doesn't know how many books i buy has been like <laughs> <laughs> what she can't see she doesn't know so yeah yes, yes. Yeah. but um, yeah i mean i love paperbacks i love special edition hardbacks but just yeah. the convenience of having ebooks, and sometimes because when I'm going with my children, you know, if they have to do drop them somewhere, I have to wait over there. I can read on my phone. I know it's not ideal, but if I have to, I can read on my phone too. So yeah, nice, nice. Um, oh, 
<laughs> I lost my train of thought completely. Happy wife, happy life. Absolutely true. But also what she doesn't know. But I do like Tim's comment going back to talking about the weather and the burning books. Well, the, the melting books. Uh, yeah, man. Seasons are actually nice. Now that I live in North Carolina, where because I lived in Southern California, then I live in Central Florida. Neither of those places are renowned for oh. their seasons, you know? No. No, no. Just but, uh, right. Um, so you're reading a ton. You're reading. Hey, oh, I, I didn't want to mention... Chris, I'm talking with me here. If anyone's joining, you know, we've had more people joining. Thank you for being here. Appreciate we've been talking about me here is uh, life and his, uh, you know, coming to the U.S. from India. Uh, we're also doing a giveaway of three copies of the latest edition of Grim Dwarf magazine. Me here has decided to do that. And thank you again for doing that. So if you're here in the comments, then you're entered into the giveaway. And if you want to give me that like and subscribe while you're here, especially some new folks, that would be wonderful. Please do. Please do. That'll at least be appreciated. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thanks for being here, Mike. Thanks for being here, NJ. Didn't say that earlier. But appreciate you hanging out. Um, I'm just laughing at Beth's comment. Hot and armpit of hell. Yeah, that was that was definitely Central Florida. Yep. Yep. Um, angry wife, house of strife. You know, I haven't heard that one. That's pretty good. What are seasons in Massachusetts? Uh, like, I, I thought that Massachusetts had some seasons. What is it? I guess, does it? Northeast has some gorgeous falls. Yeah. Massachusetts in Boston right now, so which is why I can say that. Okay. All right. Okay. So you read a ton of ebooks. So, first of all, I want to know how enormous is your TBR? I imagine it's, it's oh. ridiculous. How often do you actually have to buy books these days? Because I kind of imagine in the position, like, not only are you reading probably some Spiffbo stuff, but I have to imagine that people are constantly like, me here, read my book, me here, read my book, right? People are nice enough to do that. Like, and honestly, that's like, yeah. that's, that's, that's the perk. Uh, I try not to buy books just because my prob my wife is really super strict. And again, that's just because of the, uh, you know, <laughs> space constraints, which is very fair. Uh, some back like, that. Yeah, sorry. Oh, no, no, Go like ebooks included. You're, you're, you're not buying like ebooks really much here. Oh, because I mean, you have to be. I do buy ebooks a lot. Like, just. Just to give an example, I am I'm subscribed to BookBub, and every day in the morning you get, mm -hmm. you know, you get an email of, you know, here are the books on sale. So on an average, I buy at least two to three books every day. Not fun, <laughs> but it is what it is. But it's a, it's on sale. So like I, I justify the moment. It's like, and I'm not drinking coffee. I can buy at least two to three books. It'll be fine. They're on sale. But besides that, you know, for example, when our SPFU starts, like, you know, we everybody gets excited and you're like, your books, and you're like, you're always trying to find out, oh, which is a cool book, which is not a cool book. So, you know, I, I grab stuff from there. And then, you know, thanks to everybody on Twitter, because you often hear about like, you know, here's a cover reveal, or here's this author talking about this stuff. And if a book interests you, I just go ahead and buy it. Because besides, you know, if I'm, I mean, yes, sometimes I just approach the author and ask them, hey, can I get a, you know, especially if it's not released yet, I can ask for an ERC. But if it's out already, uh, I just and I'm not sure when I'm going to be able to read it. I just buy the cop e copy because then it just makes my life easier. Yeah. Sometimes, so I do like to ask the authors to if I can buy books directly from them and they can they can sign it. So for example, this one, mm -hmm. this was such a cool looking book and it was gorgeous because I have heard a lot about Daniel Maldman's Exile of Zanzibar. It was I was also kind nice. of looking for like a Roman Greek ish fantasy book. Uh, yeah. Not particularly but i wish that title was used for this one romanticy and um, oh. it has <laughs> lots of cool stuff like lots of illustrations in it as well because the, daniel the author is also an artist so you have stuff like this in the middle of it so oh, nice. uh, i just you know i kind of like dm him out of the blue and like hey can i buy a book from you will you please sign it and he was super kind enough to do that so this is yeah. eventually i'm going to be reading it after hopefully spf ends I just don't know when, but I also have the e-copy of that because I got the e-copy of that first because I read mm -hmm. a few like a uh, few chapters. I'm like, oh, this is really cool. Then I saw, uh, saw the uh, hardcore. I was like, yeah, I I yeah. Know about, but that's okay. That's really cool. So, how do you how do you even decide what you're going to read these days? Because again, like I mean, you, like I'm sure you you probably have to read like the the some of the spiffbo stuff, but then there's yeah. I'm sure there's like a, just a bunch of people going like, oh, I'd love it if you reviewed my stuff, like. How how do you how do you deal with kind of that and then and then how do you make room for like the things that you're like oh I, I really want to you know Honestly, if you I have no good answer to that because my mind is like a chaotic panda but you're absolutely <laughs> right uh, yeah, yeah, just knocking right. over bamboo everywhere <laughs> it is weird like that I I I don't know I mean some people are organized and kudos to them I wish that they could you know yeah. somebody could find that gene and then insert it into me because I would love mm -hmm. that but there are authors whom I'm going to be reading 
when they release a book. Like, for example, Rachel Aaron, Dirk Ashton, Richard Nell, Rob J. Hayes, John Conley, Jeffrey Deaver. Like, these are some of my favorite authors. They release a book. I'm going to be reading that. And of course, most of them are kind enough to send me an ARC. So I kind of, you know, when to put them in. Uh, SPFPO, of course, takes a huge chunk of it, nine years now. So, you know, I kind of know when and what to read. Uh, but then, yeah, so if something comes up, like, for example, uh, this book, this is one of my favorite books, which I happen to just read because of this awesome cover. This is a Sean T. King Ooh. cover. And mm -hmm. I don't know. I know a lot of people not have heard of it, but this is really a fantastic book. If you nice. love Sons of Anarchy, if you oh. love horror, if you want to read about, a, you know, imagine if the Targaryens or the Lannisters ever ran a bicycle slash crime club. This is the book for you. <laughs> is like I, I and I just have I didn't know my, anything about this. I just saw this cover. And I was like, I want to read it. And I read the mm. black blurb, and I was like, Oh, it's about a bicycle. Like it's a, it's about like a, it's it's about a family which is you know having their own bicycle motorcycle club, and they're involved in crime. There's horror. I was in so the, stuff like this. If I see something which I like, uh, I'm gonna jump on it. And then of course you know if somebody like Bo or Beth or you know Patrick or. Nick Borelli or Lynn, somebody just they happen to review a book and I happen to read that review. And I'm like, I want to read that book. That's what happened. So, like I said, my mind is a chaotic mess. Unfortunately, it is not as organized. I, I know there's some people who can give you some beautiful answers, like they have everything, you know, strategized and they know sure. what I said using and everything. I do not. I do not have a good answer. I'm just a you know chaotic monkey who loves what do I love to read. And yep. Maybe we got to go with Bo's suggestion. He says an AI bot to randomly pick the next book from TBR. That could work. That could work. He also that says, you know, you had me at Sons of Anarchy. I, I say, oh. me here, you know how to sell a book because you're like, uh, if the Lannisters had a bike gang, I'm like, okay. I mean, <laughs> I mean, read it. Like, this is Bo. You're not going to regret this book. This, unfortunately, the book, the author has only released one book. It is kind of like a complete story. Uh, it is meant to be book one because it says so, Outlaw Arcana, book one. Mm -hmm. But this is, ah. Uh, I cannot like and oh another cool fact the author has like you know does heraldry for each of the you know gang members as well as the different different bike clubs with similar to George R. R. Martin like you know how he has their you know the knights and their uh, you know each house has their own you know saying motto and everything all of it is mixed in that it is amazing that's pretty fun great segue into Beth's question what are your favorite urban fantasy books. I should also paraphrase that I'm not as well read in urban fantasy as Beth is, because Beth's just read way more books than me. She did uh, say earlier that you have great taste, though. So yes, she's being kind. She's always been. That's the one thing you, you have to know about Beth. She's always being super kind. Like you know, she <laughs> she's one of my good friends too. I will say this, but she is always super kind. And I, 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 I was. Uh, I mean, I still am, but I just don't read urban fantasy as much because urban fantasy is not. You know, it's becoming static, but one of my, a few of my favorite series and authors are the Kate Daniel series by Ilona Andrews. It is hands down possibly the best series. You know, we, I loved Rest and Files as well, but for the last few books, I haven't really enjoyed them as much. Um, oh, the Daniel Faust series by Craig Schaefer, also the Harmony Black series by Craig Schaefer. Cannot say enough good things about these two series. If you haven't read Craig Schaefer, jump in on her books she is fantastic and i'm saying she because craig schaefer is her uh pseudonym that's why her real name is heather schaefer uh she is just 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 mm. just too good uh, oh uh the heart striker series by rachel aaron if you haven't read it it is a crazy mix of comedy dragons sci-fi uh, post-apocalyptic uh you know fantasy urban fantasy all set in this place called the detroit free zone the dfc and you have to read why uh, and I think Beth is mentioning that as well, Rachel Aaron's Dragon Series. That's the Hot Striker series by Rachel Aaron. These are some of my favorite urban fantasy books. Also, haha, and <laughs> yeah. anger. It's urban fantasy mixed with horror, mixed with crime. Uh, if you if you love Sons of Anarchy, if you are interested in the horror uh, that Stephen King does, you know, kind of like <laughs> Lovecraftian, but not outright Lovecraftian, just tiny bits of it, you can check this out and also all the other books that i mentioned there's more but i'm going to shut up because otherwise i will never shut up <laughs> all right yeah, that's fun um nice 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 yeah definitely some some things to add to my tbr there uh while we're also talking about favorites there you want to tell us about that art that's behind you oh yes uh this is thanks to um, the that. generosity of dirk ashton Ooh. this is uh Ooh. an illustration from his oh go ahead I'm still oh, here. 
I'm oh, still here. I just yeah. This is an illustration from his most recent book, the Kraken Writers Z series, which hopefully most of you have read or at least checked out. Look at that beautiful cover. But this is about his Kraken uh, Z Tarot, and a specific. This is actually a scene from the book. So if you have read the book, you probably know what the scene is. But this is all thanks to Dirk Ashton. I got to hang it over here. You super. That's nice. cool. Did he send that to you? He did. He printed it out. Um, and sent it. Nah, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. That, like, yeah, I feel like that. Uh, that one, that that book, and then the series would probably do well with like a a uh, special edition at some point. I could see. Wasn't it like? Uh, I mean, Wraithmark is the publisher yeah. of the of the yeah. So yep, it is. It. it is published by Wraithmark, Dirk Ashton, and David Estes. Um, I hope so. I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but you never know. I know Wraithmark does a lot of special Kickstarters. So maybe oh yeah. You know, I forgot you have decorization yeah. on that one, right? I do. He was such a nice guy. But again, that's thanks to her. He not only did me, but he did a lot of people. He did uh, Petrick, Nick Broly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Rob Brogenet. J. Hayes and, and there's uh, Rob J. Hayes. There's uh, Michael uh, Fletcher. Fletcher. Yeah. Fletcher. There's Phil Tucker. There's uh, AC Cobble. There's uh, <laughs> Lady uh, ML Spencer. There's Kareem Hafuz, um, who's going to be a writer in the future. Uh, you, you, you know, he's going to come out with a fantastic historical fiction fe uh, featuring our very favorite topic, the Mongols. And there's Could, a bunch more people that I'm forgetting. There is a lot of decorations in this book, yeah. and it is hilarious the way he does it. Right. But none of them, like, what I appreciate about it, too, is that, like, you don't need, like, I didn't catch all of them, and that's okay. It didn't take anything away from the book at yeah. all. Like, if you if you know them and you catch them and you're like, <laughs> you know, yes. it adds. But it doesn't, it's not something that you need to have. Yeah. No. Kind of, like, makes me think of uh, Nicholas Eames, Kings of the Wild. There was mm -hmm. a bunch of, you know, uh, like, of course, it's very, like, oh, you know, the bands are going on tour. Like, you can, you get that. But then, like, slow hand is what they call Eric Clapton. <laughs> and that's what he oh. called the the main character. Yeah. So it, I have no idea about that. But you're absolutely right. Like, there's a lot of fun things like that, and I've heard about it. I just didn't know it, and it doesn't detract yeah. from my story reading because I'm not a big music fan, and I still enjoyed the book. Right? Exactly. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. But when you, <laughs> and then I was like, oh, clapped in. Oh no! Uh, I still seem to be. Like, let us know in chat who's paused. I think maybe me here paused. Uh -oh. Maybe he's going to come back. Oh, oh, oh hello. Did I, did I, I think you did. Back? Are you back? Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, no. That's fine. That's fine. These things happen. It's technology, but uh, yeah, it seemed like uh, it seemed like you were kind of there uh, briefly. Bo, Dirk is such a great guy. If you ever meet him, Nicholas, he gives off fun uncle vibes. Very true. I did actually. I think he was. I've managed to talk to an interview with all four of the former co-hosts of Wizards, Warriors, and Words. Um, so, oh, Jed Hearn, Rob J. Hayes, because Mike Fletcher, yep, Dirk Ashton, yep, that is pretty cool. Yep. Right? You know yeah, you that do? was that's pretty like fun. A reunion on your channel. You should have a reunion episode <laughs> of them on your channel. That'll be I would be yeah, all right from your lips. Good. <laughs> Dirk, Rob, Mike, and, and Jed, if you guys want to do a reunion, I'm more than happy to host that. That would be fun. Uh, but yeah, Dirk was lovely to talk to. And actually, like just to sing Dirk's praises a little bit more. But he, I was uh, I was uh, DMing him on Instagram, and I, I had him like read my blurb for my work in progress that I'm writing, um, like like my back cover blurb, and he's like, "This is cool, I like it. Do you mind if I take a stab at maybe some stuff?" And I was thrilled to have him uh, uh, offer that. And then I got excited, and I made like a 15 minute little short video that was just for him of like explaining what's going on in the book, and like I'm like I. I the, because those are hard. Writing a blurb is really hard, especially too if you're like kind of new to it. It's hard mm -hmm. to know how much to share and how much to hold back. So in that video, I was kind of sharing more than I maybe thought I should. And but then he like he really helped me refine that. So Dirk is the man. Dirk, if you ever watch this, you're the man. Thank you. Appreciate that. Also, and for all the authors, you know, on that on their channel, the Wizard Voice and Words, they have a very specific episode about this, about the blurbs, how to create a perfect blurb and everything like that. We'll go watch that episode just because it is super fun. And they, nice. you know, Michael R. Fletcher will give you wonderful knowledge with his with his way of talking as well. But yeah, yeah. just watch that episode. Uh, NJ agrees, blurbs are the worst thing ever, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're a little good. Uh, Beth says <laughs> she yes. runs his fan club. 
But then Bo says the correct way to read all of Dirk's books is with no pants on, <laughs> which is, of course, a joke from the Wizards, Wizards, and Words. Tim laughs. Uh, uh, NJ says, now I'm interested. <laughs> you should, NJ. And if you don't want to read Kraken Riders Z because, you know, the only one book is out, you can check out his Pattern Astrology. It's complete. It's a gorgeous series. And it is also urban fantasy, but epic fantasy. It's it's just amazing. There's no, there's no way to describe it. It's like if Tolkien had written urban fantasy featuring all the mythology of the world, that's how you would write it. And if and if you want to read it with no pants on, that's totally fine. No one's going to judge. Yeah. It's whatever. <laughs> what you do with in, your, in the in the sanctity of your house is totally up to you. Right, right. Um, all right. So me here. I got to ask you too. Um, I was talking just this past Monday with an author that's doing this like slightly different indie path. Right. I feel like for a while now we've had, you know, of course, traditional publishing, and then we've had the the, the indie path that's been forged and you, like the question with india has pretty much basically been do you go exclusive to amazon or do you go wide and that's like that's the extent of the questions maybe you want to wonder if you do like ingram spark or if you go just to like you know kindle print but that's pretty set. It off, right? yeah right what she is doing and what other people have done over the last few years and had a lot of success with they're serializing their fiction posting it free online on some there's a few different websites right. where it's Royal, Royal Road is the big one. Yep. Yeah. And then there's one more I'm forgetting. Um, there's, oh, hang on. Now I want to get P? this right. It begins with a P or something like that? See, so yeah, that one I haven't heard of. Oh, because um, Royal Road is mostly lit RPG. I know that Royal, a lot of people on Royal Road are lit, lit RPG and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something with a P. I'm... The Scribble Hub is the other one that I'm familiar with. That there's one. Wattpad. I feel like what? Campfire is, is Wattpad. Is that the one you were thinking? Of? Yep, Wattpad was the one I was thinking. Of. And Campfire is like an app, right? But the entire like books are being posted uh, on there in Campfire. See, I'm gonna get to talk to Jackson Dickert at some point, I think, and I really want to ask him about, you know, that yeah, because he he they're trying to make it, and he's I think their marketing chief. I know he's involved with yep. Campfire, so. Well, I met him too at Dragon Con, so he he's really funny. Uh, he's also the guy behind that video channel of uh, inter between two perms, uh, you know, which was his interview. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Tim, I'm glad you already got that answer there. But yes, yeah. What's the channel name again for the what we were talking about before? It's Wizards, Warriors, and Words. Thank you, Bo, for answering that. Appreciate it. Um, and that was a great, great podcast. I was sad when it ended, but it was that one's so fun, Tim. If you haven't checked that out, I mean, there's that one, and of course, there's Writing Excuses, which is also fantastic. I love the hosts there. Um, but Wizards, Warriors, and Words was like th what was fun about it, and, and Writing Excuses is very similar. But what was fun about uh, Wizards, Warriors, and Words was it always just felt like you were just like in a room with with the four of them while they were just bullshitting you know and it, yes, you just it sort of felt like you were you were in on it it was it was a good time yeah it was uh, super duper, duper fun <laughs> wait what had to deal with that slogan a lot as a kid what are we talking about here leaky but oh yeah yeah the 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 uh, Fletcher's new podcast, Dripping yeah. Bucket. Uh, Chris Fletcher, Michael R. Fletcher, and Crystal Matar, Dripping Bucket. Yep, yep, really yep, good. yep. I think a new episode is, is landing tomorrow as well. The next new episode. Yeah, yeah, good stuff there. You should check that one out too if you want him. Um, yeah, yeah. So I was talking about the yeah, this um serialization. So they they post this serialized on the website. And you'll post advanced like advanced chapters on Patreon and be able to monetize it that way because on the website, of course, it's it's free for people to read. But the, yeah. the, the advantage of doing this is that you especially if you're writing in the genres that are popular on these websites, you're going to get eyeballs. Audience right? based building, yeah, exactly. So then you kind of transfer that audience to Patreon, and then eventually you bring that story over to Amazon and especially Kindle Unlimited and some of that like lit RPG uh, uh, mm -hmm. percussion fantasy stuff is doing very well on the Kindle Unlimited. Oh, so very well, they're doing. Like there's people who are earning six figures plus and none of us have heard of them. Right? Yeah, yeah. Like it's so interesting how there's a little bit of segmentation, stratification going on there. Um, which kind of makes sense. I mean, not like I really have no idea who's popular in like crime. I, books, I know they're you know popular, I mean? but I kind of I heard of them or met them in Dragon Con and I was like, who? And, right. and and Dirk and I were like, no, no, this guy is really super popular because if you look up, like, they have thousands of reviews on each of their books. Mm -hmm. Their sales are through the roof. But again, mm -hmm. it's like a very niche audience. And of course, 
the audience wants that way. Like the audience wants these books, which are like serialized. They mm-hmm. want the character to slowly ascend. They want, like, I think somebody explained this to me. Like they, they said this, like these are all gamer people who now have gotten it reading, but they mm-hmm. still want the game, like the, the things they, they, they played in the game. They want that in fiction and lit RPG hits that sweet spot. And so if you can hit yeah. it, you're going to be rich. And that's just the truth of it. It's not <laughs> yeah, a yeah. reader, but yeah. And yeah. especially in Kindle, because they, you know, for them, it's like you pay a monthly fee and you get these thousands of books and the authors get page reads. So it's it's like a win-win. Of course, Amazon yeah. is the main, uh, is the main uh, P, uh, the winner. Main yeah, yeah. Yeah, but whatever. At least, you know, I can curse Amazon a lot, but I have to give them props. I have to give them props for certain things that they do. The RPG is earning. There's some really weird author names. Though. Like some of the authors, they hide behind pseudonyms. Some of those are just like the weirdest pseudonyms. Like I... I'm forgetting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shirtaloon. Shirtaloon <laughs> yes. That guy yes. had come to Dragon Con and I was like, what? And they had to repeat the name a couple of times. And then I had to look at him like, Shirtaloon. But hey, the reader. Yeah, yeah. Up. But the dude is actually, he's number two. Because uh, again, I was uh, talking with someone just on Monday kind of about this whole approach. Mm-hmm. Shirtaloon, Travis something. He's number two on all of Patreon for writing. Again, there is an audience who want. Something yeah. very specific. They're not the, your regular readers. They will go to Kindle. They go to Royal Road. They go to you know Wattpad. I mean less Wattpad. So, but like Patreon as well. And if they get what they want, they will subscribe, and the money will mm-hmm. flow to at least those authors. So good for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, th- I think I already know the answer. But my question was going to be for you: like, do you read any serialized fiction? Are you are you aware of any of the? I mean, clearly you're aware. But are you checking out any of these sites for things to read? Unfortunately, unless it's somebody like Alec Hudson, like for example, Alec Hudson had written his, uh, you know, his, uh, I think last year or year before that, he released, uh, this is really funny, he released a cozy Lovecraftian fantasy. I know that sounds weird as hell, but it is super, super duper fun. Uh, it was called, and again, I'm going to forget the name because I'm an idiot, but sorry, forgive me. Uh, uh-huh. It's for a great cover, uh, Lovecraftian book. It was Zog, the Book of Zog. That's what it was called, the Book of Zog. It is really funny, and that was because it was Alec Hudson. I knew him, uh, so when he was po- he had posted upon his that you know he's releasing the chapters on Royal Road, so I started reading those. But again, I'm impatient. I want the next chapter because if I really get into a story, I want to keep reading. So which is why I don't read serials. Uh, Ilana Andrews, sense. they're my one of my favorite authors. They often serialize their upcoming short stories or novellas on their blog. But then again, the the crazy raccoon in my head is like. I want <laughs> so I force myself to either read it only when it's done or just you know wait yeah. until it's done and buy the book. That's fair. That's fair. All right. I got one more question for you. This has been lovely. Uh this one also, Beth, Bo, uh, Mike Mullen, if you're still around, if you guys want to chime in on here, I'd love to hear your perspective too. But what like trends do you think you're sort of seeing or you think might be coming in in any part of books, whether it's having to do with, you know, covers or reviews or, or what people are writing or genres or, I mean, obviously we're, I feel like, I can't tell if we're sort of still in the middle or if we're on the back of the like cozy fantasy trend um, or if that's going to be more long lived. Yeah. I think we're kind of slowing down uh, in the cozy fantasy. It'll still be a few more years just because, you know, because of how publishing works, like they're still, acquiring cozy fantasies and they're in the process of maybe another three to four years of cozy fantasy again not a bad thing uh, just that unfortunately when all the books come out it my cozy fantasy might be over or something like that mm-hmm. uh, cozy fantasy is tricky just because you know there's certain things which i love about cozy fantasy but then it's also like i want more high stakes and i don't get that so it's like uh it's stopping me from enjoying it i'm hoping epic fantasy comes back because epic fantasy is you know we haven't had a really I don't know, outright like epic fantasy that everybody has fallen in love with. I'm hoping maybe that's just around the corner. Uh, maybe, uh, oh, Drop Chi Hayes' God Eater. I've read the first book, Herald. I loved it. I've been bugging him. You know, I'm hoping that bugging him. I do bug him a lot, but I'm hoping he releases the sequel. <laughs> I mean, he, st- he starts writing sequel. It's going to be a couple of years because, again, it's a big book and he also has to write other two books. Because, book. Yeah, it's not just one book. He's like, yeah. he's he's kind of committed to dropping three books at a time with that oh, yeah. series, so, which is awesome. Yeah. I love the fact that he's doing that. I think it's so uh, like uh, ambitious and exciting. 
it's Rob J. Hayes. He never does things the easy way. Like he never does <laughs> things the easy way. Like you know, it, it drives me crazy sometimes. But it's like it's Rob. So you know, I, I I love him and I love his book. So I'm gonna. But yeah, I'm hoping Epic Fantasy makes a you know really huge comeback. Uh, oh, the the sequel to the Umbral Storm. This was the book I loved uh, from 2022. Alec Hudson. He is one of the most beloved authors, but he's also underrated. A lot of, lot of, lot of people know about him. His, his debut trilogy, the Raveling trilogy, was really huge. Patrick loved it. A lot of people loved it, but if you, a lot of people haven't read it yet. And he does this really cool thing where he combines like Eastern, uh, I don't want to say East Asian because it's, it's, it's a secondary fantasy world, but he'll take aspects of East Asian um, culture and then fuse it into his worlds, you know, where it's, you kind of get like both medieval, Western worlds and Eastern, the, Revel the Raveling trilogy did this, but also did, did some cool features, but his most recent series, The Shattered Few, it is to my mind, if you're a Brandon Sanderson fan, you need to check it out because he has taken aspects of, well, he hasn't taken, but he has, if you love the Cosmere, if you love his, you know, what's the big, the big series of his, which I'm forgetting the name, Brandon's big Stormlight series. Stormlight Archive. Stormlight Archive, yeah. If you love the vastness of the Stormlight Archive, if you love the vastness of the world in Stormlight Archive, you're going to get all of that in, uh, you know, uh, in the Shattered Few series. And But here's the cool part. It's more epic. It's kind of like Wheel of Time-ish. So it's it's just perfect for nice. you know, hitting that sweet spot. And nice. this is just a personal thing for me, but I'm a huge David Gemmell slash heroic fantasy slash sword and sorcery fan. Um, mm -hmm. I'm hoping more authors release like you know sword and sorcery slash heroic fantasy books where you know it, it doesn't have to be like an out and out hero. It can be like a you know gray hero. It can be somebody who's not even considered a hero. But I mm -hmm. want more books like that because I just love you know what David Gemmell used to do, what Anthony Anthony Ryan did with you know Blood Song because this book is amazing. Nice. I wish nice. there's more books like this, but. There haven't been, and I'm waiting for that. I know Michael R. Fletcher and Crystal Matar eventually plan to write a heroic fantasy. I've been bugging slash harassing them for it, so uh, hopefully they will. But I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was hearing about that on a dripping bucket, and the way that they were kind of talking about it, it's like, oh, this sounds really exciting. You know, we'll see. Yes, I've it's there so much to today, David Gamel as well. Based on what you're talking about, though, I may have some recommendations for you. We'll see. But have you heard of um, Stone in the Sky by Zia Diamanti? Wait, what? Zia no? Diamanti. No. All right. All right. I'll have to. I'll. Uh, we'll see about. We'll talk later. But uh, Beth, with that question, says lots of lit RPG and more hope punk. All right. Definitely, I think lit RPG. Is up and coming, and I don't see it slowing down because I think the reason that you're you're talking about, like I think, kind of people that grew up playing games, I, I think this sort of scratches a similar itch. I don't really like lit RPG. I don't. Well, the one exception I think is the way that uh, I haven't read it yet, but the the way that it sounds like a dungeon crawler Carl has handled it. Are you familiar with that one? I am. Thanks to Beth, I'm. Uh, 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 I've, I've Carl did Matt Diddyman. He's the author yeah. behind it. I think yeah. he did a kick everything I, I know beth has read it and she's been you know talking about that book i haven't read it uh i know about it i've read matt Diniman's self-published book from 2007 or 2008 <laughs> i have that uh, right uh, wow I wait know. what he he self-published one that long ago i didn't know that wow okay crazy story i it's called the Man. steward's guy it's now republished into three books but i have the original edition somewhere over here uh, I met him Dragon Con. I was like, I know that guy. I actually told him about. It. He said it's not self-published. It's kind of a, it's kind of like from an indie press. Whatever. I just call it self-published because this was way yeah, back yeah. in 2008. But no, I have. I I know of him. I just haven't read these Dungeon Crawler call books. I need to, but yeah. maybe I'll do one day. Dude, good for him to like because I know he's like he's he's really like Dungeon Crawler Carl has hit mm -hmm. like yeah. yeah and like that's awesome that he kept going. You know, to like for like a small press. That's yeah, yeah. That's he's Good he's also released a lot of books. It's not just this. Even before that, he's he kept on releasing other other books. Yeah, yeah. But he you know he's been doing this for I think more than 15, 18 years yeah. or so. That's so. good for him. Good uh, for him. yeah. Dungeon. Wait, yeah, it's gonna be the next lunch. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I feel like it's already kind of like. Maybe it's, like because it's not, you know, because Legends and Lattes has been traditionally published, and now a lot more yeah. people you know get by it. But Dungeon Crawler, uh, Crawler Call, you know, if it's if it gets picked up by traditional publishing, then it'll be, you know, it'll it'll hit yeah. more. See, and this is the thing too. Like, I feel like like these genres 
work mm -hmm. so well in audio. And I know that uh, Will White and his Cradle series, like it, with uh, Travis Baldry narrating, it's just yeah. he, that's how Will White became a New York Times bestseller was because of the audio books, you know. Um, yeah. it, but they work so well in audio, I, I think, especially for kind of the, the like the gamer generation people that are consuming this because they can kind of you know they, they're enjoying that content while they're doing other things and it sort yeah. of feels familiar in a way while they're having to kind of be adults you know yeah, exactly that no and it's and it's great because audio books have allowed a whole bunch of people who are not readers to yeah. now be readers or to read or to get to enjoy books so kudos yeah i mean it, it counts yeah. in, for that eternal question on Twitter, does audiobook count as reading? Yes, it does count as reading. So yes, yeah, yes, 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 yes. anybody who reads or listens to audiobooks, great. Keep keep doing that. So yeah. Uh, let me ask kind of similarly, and I want to go back to some of the other answers that other folks have had at the yes, previous sure. question. But similarly, um, kind of posit to the audience, Beth, Bo, Mike, um, what do you guys think of kind of this this sort of trend of the serialization and that and that path from like Royal Road or other sites to the Patreon to Amazon, because to me it seems like it's actually a big win for everyone. Because if if you're a reader and you want to check it out early and you like reading the serialized, you can read it for free, which is great. If you're the writer, then you're getting eyeballs, which is the most important thing that you need. You're getting eyeballs in the beginning, but then you're also able to monetize it in a in a recurring and predictable way with Patreon, which is also huge. Yep. And then you monetize it, of course, on Amazon and Kindle Unlimited, and then hopefully an audiobook as well. It seems like it's a big. I'm sorry. You build up an audience for it as well, you know, by releasing the yeah. chapters because word of mouth spreads on Royal Road. Exactly, exactly, exactly. It seems like it's a big win, and I'd love to hear kind of your takes on it. But let's go back to their answers, kind of to the previous question. Yeah, lit RPG. Uh, um, 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 uh. NJ, by the way, agreed with you about more epic fantasy, please. Yeah. Um, Hope Punk, Beth said, along with the Lit RPG, Hope Punk, I think, is really interesting. And I think, yeah, there's more room for that. Uh, Bo had said, a little bit long for the betting man, I would say that the Cozy Fantasy and Grimdark have hit their peak for now. That's interesting. That's interesting. Uh, I think Epic is going to make a comeback, and then I think Lit RPG is going to finally cross over and go mainstream. I also think we might see a resurgence in Classic Fantasy as well. Yeah. That So... I agree with you. I remember seeing on Twitter there was like an agent that was like, "Hey, I'm really looking for lit RPG." So, like, that's gonna happen. Also, I think. Orbit editor, if I'm not wrong, um, the or editor of Orbit Books. I'm forgetting her name. Again, I believe it on my mind now that she's forgettable or something. Like she had also posted about that. In fact, mm -hmm. Orbit Books is has commissioned lit RPG books from David Dalglish, and he's gonna be coming mm -hmm. up with those next year. They're gonna be released in rapid succession, succession as well. So, wow. We might see more lit RPG from the traditional published side. Nice, nice. Resurgence in classic fantasy. All right. What is... I, I don't have in my mind what classic fantasy is. Well, <laughs> I, I know epic fantasy. I know urban fantasy. I know progression fantasy. What is classic well, fantasy classic, as a subgenre? You know, where it's clean, the cleaner, like Terry Brooks-ish fantasy, where, like, you know, it's... it's The violence is... I mean, it's kind of more, like, epic only, but it's just, like, less violent, so as to speak, maybe. That's okay. kind of like, I'm sure. Again, how would you, would you, how would you maybe compare it to like Noble Bright, which I interpret to sort of be like the opposing from Grimdark, like mm -hmm. you know? Oh uh, well, it doesn't necessarily have to be Noble Bright, but it can be like you know a, a, a best example of classic fantasy would be Terry Brooks, and like a lot of his books were epic, but they weren't as gruesome, so as to speak. The violence was there, but it was you know you didn't you didn't see the blood on the pages, you didn't see. You know, like the it, like the action happened, but then it was also I don't want to say sanitized, but it was it was cleaner, so to speak. Maybe that's what they're talking about. Maybe that's what Bo is talking about. Like oh, Lord mm -hmm. of the Rings, mm -hmm. like that said, mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings, epic fantasy. Okay, um, so more songs. Yeah, <laughs> and Tom Bombadil. <laughs> yeah, right. Tom Bombadil, more songs. No, no, no. Okay, all right, all right. I'm fair. Uh, Mike had said the longer that he's writing, the less he knows about the industry. He's sticking with writing books to love. No deeper insight. That's cool. I like it. But then Bo surprised me. The real question is when will May here me here drop his work and you're are you working on you were working on something? No, I am not a no. Bo. Unless Bo is writing for me. Like, you know, if Bo is doing that, then <laughs> great. I will you know, use his literary skills and just publish now. But I'm not I'm not a Bo. I am a reader. I am always be a reader. I am not talented enough to be a writer. I enjoy reading people's books because it's it fuels my imagination. And that's where I get all my joy from. 
I wish I was as talented enough to become a writer, but no, unfortunately. Or so so Bo though in response to my question about the serialization, he basically saying that he doesn't read anything on on those sites, but too many amazing books I binge all at once. Uh, good, but you also mentioned like Dungeon Crawler Carl, and you uh, enjoyed it, and that I think right didn't you? You're one of the people that said you enjoyed it in chat. I think maybe it was and that. said yeah, but I think uh, Mike did also. I thought Bo had also, but uh, audio of that. No, right, sorry. No, no, you're good. And Dungeon Crawler Carl got its start on Royal Road. Actually, it has a different cover on Royal Road, and it really? looks way worse. <laughs> I mean, the cover that is there on Amazon isn't really great as well, but I'm guessing... Uh, it's not it's just, bad. It's corny. You see it? We'll go look at sure? it. It's it's corny, but I think it works because the people love the content. Right. It's really a case where people are not judging the book by its cover, and that works. Yeah. Yeah. He did not read Dungeon oh, Crawler. he's not read. Okay, all right. My bad, my bad. I was going to say, like, uh, I want to look. It at just the, had a Kickstarter. What? Yeah. Did it? I missed that. It did. It did. It did. It did. It was, it was huge. And um, was it, it a special edition? I, it was a hardcore edition. Ah. Uh, I think, I but know. The, you know what? Even if you missed it, don't worry. There'll be a there'll be a edition there'll be a Kickstarter for the second edition uh, for the second book, and you can of course buy the first book in in that Kickstarter as well. Because if, if a Kickstarter is that successful, I think yeah, like how much in three hundred and seventy six thousand, like more than a yep. third of a million. If if a yeah. Kickstarter is that successful, it's of course going to have you know they're going to do another one. Yeah, the DC, yep. DC, DC series, right? So there's of course going to be if you miss the first one, you can buy you know you can join in on the second or third one, and you can get the previous books as well. Yep, yep. There we go. Three hundred seventy six thousand, just like you're saying, eighteen. 18,400 was their goal. They beat yep. that by a little. Yep. Oh, yep. yeah. Uh, but check this out. That's the the original. Oh, yeah. Right? I somehow like this one better than the one that's on Amazon, though. I don't know. Really? Why. Yeah, the Amazon oh, one just makes it seem like very corny. Like it's. But, but it is, right? I, again, what do I know? I haven't read the book. I'm not the target audience. So it's perfectly okay. fine. Okay. Okay. Like, no, it seems reference. I haven't read it yet either, but it seems really fun. But I, I do like like the my understanding of the way that like um even though it's lit RPG, like the main character doesn't like wake up in a game or whatever. It's like the world completely changes and he's now sort of in a yeah. game. And like, yeah, so yeah, and then they fun. they get to be the power up, so as to speak. Yeah. <laughs> There's no bueno. I agree. Like that one was we do. But um uh interesting about the yeah 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 i get the draw for, yeah bo was saying get the draw for the yeah yeah, yeah yeah right 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 i already mentioned that okay um me here i lied i've got one more question sure. <laughs> um i asked about yeah like kind of trends with books trends with the uh, industry all that sort of thing what about um well, I know that you know, trends with like Spiffbo and these kind of competitions. I would love to hear kind of your thoughts, also Beth's thoughts, Bo's thoughts, Mike's thoughts. Um, I know that Spiffbo just made some changes for this year, right? In terms of like how um, yeah. how, to, how enter. to enter. Yeah. First, can you talk about that, and then like love to kind of hear your thoughts on on trends in the future? For like, I do. I, I think these contests are fantastic. So I hope that they continue. Yeah. Some, back, some background, up till now, Swiftpo was, you know, Mark used to put it on a date. There was a Google link. You had to, you know, type in your name, your author's name, book name, upload the book, book cover separately, and submit. And until, 2000, until 2022, it used to go on within 24 hours to 48 hours. Like the first edition took, I think, seven days, eight days, and all that. So it slowly started getting down. But last year, the contest got filled up in 42 minutes. And that was shocking to all of us. We never expected that. Like, because the year before it took up to eight hours and 45 minutes or so to fill up. And we were like, oh, it'll be five hours this time, six hours. You know, you're placing. Oh, wow. So, so in, like, in, minutes, in 2021, it took eight hours. Uh, no, in 2022, it took eight hours because in 2023, yeah. it filled up in 42 minutes, 41 minutes, so to speak. Okay. So, wow. yeah, it, it, the, the contracture was there. So, Mark, this year, rather than having, again, the same idea of like, you know, just 
opening it at a special specific time because he usually used to do it somewhere like at 12 p.m or 1 p.m noon in british standard time so a lot of times it was very odd because there are people in asia there are people in europe or people in the east you know in east coast or west coast who would have such a hard time so this year he has this idea of what he's going to keep the contest or he's going to keep the opening open for 24 hours and you know allow as many entries as possible and then of those x number of entries 300 entries will be selected now a lot of people are quite unhappy with that just because you know a lot of authors who have mentioned to me that you know if you want to be part of the contest you get up at whatever time and you submit it and i see that from from that perspective because it's like it's a free contest it's free publicity all you have to do is just log in and submit it now on the flip side some people have commented but it's not possible for them because what if you know you like let's say you're a parent your the, the login time is at 6 a.m but you have to get up at 5 30 get your kids ready there's no way you'll be able to submit it until seven o'clock but you know by by that time the contest might be over and then you have to wait until the whole year so what right. do you do about that so mark is from my understanding he's testing on a method it's not going to be fixed like this way then maybe then in the next edition but this is just way, his way of tweaking the contest to make it a little bit more fair. Now, some people had commented that maybe they could have two opening periods. Maybe he'll listen to that. But we'll see how it goes. We want to see how or what happens this year. Maybe if there's a thousand entries in 24 hours, then that there's a 30% chance that any, you know anybody of getting in. Maybe that will help him or you know kind of re-evaluate this process and come up with a better method next year. So we'll see. It's it's you know you kind of hear like about democracy, like it's it's the, it's the it's the best of the worst system out there. So it's kind mm -hmm. of like that. To be fair to Mark, it's, he's trying his best as well. And again, keep in mind, he's doing this, you know, after taking care of his family and writing his book. So right, right, right. Props for that as well. So one like from so it, it's going to be open for this period of twenty four hours, and everyone can kind of submit. And then from there, it's it's just a complete random selection for the three hundred. Yes. Yes, I think what he'll do is basically just, you know, he, as they keep on coming in, or maybe after every two hours, he'll just run, he'll take the numbers and put them on his giant Excel spreadsheet. And then he'll, he'll just put in every third book. And then you know, some, hey, he'll feed out those and those will be like those three or some of that. I'm, I'm not sure. That, this is my guess at this moment, what he's going to do. We'll find out, you know, because that's going to happen in the month of May. So that will be a little bit tricky as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, so Beth said, and no more cover cart contests. And Bo says, yeah, the AI mess with the cover contest last year killed it, which was a shame. Yeah. Because there's no way for us to, you know, unfortunately know, you know, which is what is like, I mean, yes, there are people in, who are nice enough to just say either I don't know or yes, AI was used. And so those books weren't covered. But of course, the potential winner, like you know, the, the, the Sean Moss, I believe that was the guy's name who lied yeah. about. You know, saying that he did not use AI but was using AI, and then he conned the author as well. He conned not only the author of you know Matthew Prindle, but also Michael R. Fletcher as well. So, boo to that guy. Oh, so really? Oh, person. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, 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 this is an interesting idea. More subgenre specific spispos, please. I like that idea, but uh, you know, it's a lot of How work. Do you how do you react? Because you need somebody like Mark to run them, and then you need bloggers who are yeah. brave enough. For that. I mean, reading three hundred books, not three hundred, but like thirty books, and then nine more books, it's tough enough. Yeah. A lot of people have thought. Some people even thought of like you know having subgenre specific SPFPOs, which will then feed into the main SPFPO. Somebody needs to come up with a good plan, and then you know tell it to Mark, and then tell other bloggers to get involved, and maybe it'll happen. But until yeah. until that happens, we just you know we just have the one contest. It has been cool to see what uh, the uh, formerly called Baby Bow, right? The the novella competition yeah. spring up, and then I think that's Beth's uh, brainchild, Beth and a few other bloggers. Yeah, wrong. yeah. And then uh, I like to call the other one Space Fuck. You know the uh... <laughs> Space Bow is the one who wore with you. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, yep, yep. Are they? Uh, I first heard Fletcher call it Space Fuck, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm using that. Um, Knowing Michael R. Fletcher, that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's cool to see all these different ones, yeah, happening. It was very nice. Sarah won. Yay! Oh, yeah, Sarah Chun won with her. I'm forgetting the title of the. Of that's the... pretty cool. I actually didn't know that uh, I wasn't paying attention to who won, but that's fantastic. Yeah. I'll take, but. Oh, 
Spiff or tro- er, space fuck p- trophy greater than Spiff Bowcoin. Ooh, ooh, ooh spicy. Is it, what is it? Tro- trophy? I haven't looked at the trophy. Is there? I think they have a blaster, right? I think it's like a, uh, a a trophy that looks like a blaster. Well, that does. And I have to take a look at. It. I don't know what it looks like, but also the the coin is just for the finalists. The winners get the wand. So there's that. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. An SBS uh, FC. Oh. I don't think I don't think the finalists get that. I just saw that. I thanks to Bo, I'm seeing the trophy for the first time. I didn't even know this was a trophy. Can you share it, please. Go ahead yeah. and share it, please. Uh, and again, I think this is what I do to share. Sorry, my no, you're I'm good. You're good. The weirdest person when it comes to sharing. So, is what? this it, Bo? Yeah, I think that's the thing. Yeah, it does look cool, right? It does look cool. Um. I gotta get me one of them one day. <laughs> In that case, I can say that yes, it does look cooler than the like the wand or the stick. But hey, yeah. Mark came up with the idea, and of course, the finalists also get you know each finalist so far, or not each of them, but most finalists so far also have a coin. Yeah. So yeah. we made it to that special group of like I don't know six ninety people, no, not ninety. Uh, we had three, but four repeat finalists, and then two people with two fine dual finalists. So that makes it. 86, 80, 88 people have coins with them. Wow, wow, wow. And uh, you got to present those coins at some point, right? I did. I was lucky enough. That was pure, pure, pure luck because I didn't know that was supposed to happen because Mark had told me that, hey, are you planning to come to BristolCon? I was like, yes, I am planning to come to BristolCon. This was luckily, of course, last year because I wanted to make it and I would you know, meet a bunch of my European friends or you know, who I've been talking with 10 years plus, but I had never met them. And so Mark was just like, oh, we'll just have you give the coins. And I was like, okay. And I, I didn't know what that he what he meant. And then it was like, as the day progressed, he's like, well, you're going to present this. I'm like, what do you mean present? And he's like, yeah, you're going to be in a room. There's going to be stuff happening in the back. We want you to hold the mic and then, you know, just call up people. And I'm like, okay. And then, of course, it turned to be a little bit more than that. So I had to come up with an impromptu speech and then force Mark to do a speech as well, which is really fun because I get to get it. <laughs> and then the silliest part happened was, it, of course, you know, we gave, I think, to a bunch of passengers, to a bunch of you know current uh, participants as well. But then we should have taken a group photo, which we, of course, have more than half of us were drinking. So we just forgot because we were having so much fun. <laughs> uh, shout out to Bristol Con. If anybody can ever grow over there, because it is a one and a half day, but basically it's just a fun thing because everybody just hangs out in the bar and it is a great place to chit chat. And all those, you know, the UK people come and the British authors. I mean, I mean the UK authors and the European authors. It is a cool, cool, cool place to hang out. That's a that you know that that uh like description and vibe feels like what I've heard Dragon Con is like too. Well, yeah, but Dragon Con is like fifty thousand people. It's it's Dragon Con is massive. Like Dragon Con is insanely massive. You need to yeah. have like people around you to kind of have fun. Yes, you know people meet at the Western and in the evenings it's it's like in the, the entire evenings just spent over there having a chit chatting. But Bristol Con is more like this really cozy place where you you know. It's in this small one. And and of course, it's like the only con that Mark goes to because, you know, of course, with his children and everything, he cannot just go off. So mm-hmm. you can call it the Mark Lawrence con, but you get to hang out with him. <laughs> you get to meet a lot of SPFP people. And the best part is it's like for a day and a half, but it's mostly just hanging out at the bar. And it's it's, more, it's less of a bar, <laughs> and more of just like this giant open place where people can just sit and chit chat. And that's literally what happens. I got to meet Matt of Broken Binding over there. I got to meet so many other authors. I got to finally meet Rob J. Hayes as well, you know, because I've been talking to him since 2013, but I never had met him. But I got to meet him. Then I got to meet Kareem, who I've been speaking to since a long time. Then I met Rita. There's so many <laughs> friends whom I had like known for years. Legend, 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 legend. Legend. Like that's true. Right, right. Just plus, like you know, if uh, if uh, if the Legends and Lattes uh, 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 Cafe served uh, beer and whiskey too. Oh, <laughs> Everything. They, I mean, if if you if you like alcohol, they have alcohol. If you don't like alcohol, you have other drinks. You, yeah, the company yeah, yeah. is what is what matters, and it's really nice and warm, and it's great. So, me here. This has been wonderful. Uh, Mike has the perfect comment to close this out on. We were talking to you know Spiff Bo and the trends, and he had said that the reviewers are the real heroes in these contests. But you know, you're you're helping all these authors get the word out. Me here. You're helping. Uh, Rob J. Hayes, get get out there. All, all these people that you love, you're helping them so much. So we we no. salute you, sir. No, 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 I'm the junkie. These guys are feeding me. So I should be thinking that more and more. Well, I think it's a two way street, and uh, you know, 
you're you're a, a force in the industry in the community thank you for doing what you do man not at all but thank you for having me this was really really fun and thank yeah, you to everyone no. in the comments yes yeah thank you for being here my pleasure uh and thank yeah thank you everyone being here thanks for chit chatting with us for close to two hours <laughs> oh God, it's so late for you nicholas i'm so sorry no, I do this all the time. This is this is what I love. This is this is my time to uh, you know have conversations with people about the things I love, rather than a uh, you know uh, watching Bluey on repeat all the time. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you do that. You do that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all for being here. And if no one's told you today, you're an absolute legend. <laughs> oh, thank you again. Bye, everyone. <laughs>